So welcome uh, to Oxford Philosophy of Physics, um, and a particular welcome to our speaker today, Martin Lesourd. Uh, Martin did his uh, PhD here at Oxford, um, but he's now at the other place, Cambridge, <clears throat> that's Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, at the Black Hills <laughs> Institute. Uh, uh, and um, it's particular uh, delight to have Martin speak um, in this, the year of local hero Roger Penrose's um, uh, Nobel Prize, um, as, as he has made um, significant contributions himself to the singularity theories for which Roger got the prize. <clears throat> um, but his work doesn't stop there. Um, he works on all sides of foundations in general relativity, Lorentzian geometries, uh, hyperbolic and um, uh, elliptical uh, the elliptical geometry, of course, concerning the geometry of, um, of uh, space at uh, time like slices, um, uh, of a space like slice and so forth, um, and relevant to um, dealing with some of the constraints in the canonical Hamiltonian formalism. Um, okay, so um, Martin, um, the floor is yours, um, and your title um, Penrose Crosses the Street and What Has Happened Since. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Simon for the invitation, for the very kind introduction um, and for the opportunity to come back to Oxford, um, even if it's virtually. Uh, this seminar has always been uh, something important in my development and uh, I'm very glad to, to be speaking. So uh, today I'm gonna be talking about, of course, one of my heroes, um, Roger Penrose, I think is, um, has truly been a, has had a remarkable influence on general relativity. And I'll hope to convey um, just a fraction of, of, of that. I mean, his work really is so sprawling. It's touched on so many different aspects of the field. Um, his little book, Techniques of Differential Topology, um, which was written in 72, and which at the time was a kind of state of the art um, Lorentzian geometry and how to solve um, problems in Laurentian geometry was on my bedside table throughout my PhD. Uh, and it was really there in this little short book, this little short elegant book that I learned how to uh, do Laurentian geometry. So, uh, and, and the list goes on and on and on. Now, just as a quick remark, uh, what does crossing the street uh, refer to? So it, this is folklore, but um, apparently um, Roger had the idea of a trap surface upon crossing the street. Of course, trap surfaces is the key component in the singularity theorem, which we'll describe a little bit. Uh, as for what's happened since, um, well, of course, I'm not going to be able to give you a full description. I mean, there's, there's you know, um, some of the work that, that I'll be talking about starts in 1965, right? So a lot of things have happened, but I'll try to give a kind of broad brush uh, outlook on what's, what's been done in the direction of the conjectures put forward by Roger Penrose. Um, and this will include, um, a, a, you know, some some um, aspects of my work. Um, one in particular that I did during my PhD here at Oxford. So, um, so this is obviously very close to my to my heart. Um, so this is a picture of um, Roger, myself, uh, and my collaborator Nikos. Uh, we're in the math department. The tables uh, are um, writable. Uh, and we were, we were working on um, the problem of dynamical formation of black holes and trap surfaces. And we saw um, Roger and we were both excited because at that time, Nikos and I had just realized that our, uh, our work could actually give the first dynamical kind of verification of the Penrose inequality in a collapsing scenario. I'll be talking about what the Penrose inequality is in due course, but anyway, um, just for this picture, so we we were we were working on this um, on this problem, right? Which is how to form black hole, which is still an open problem. And in the course of working on this problem, we realized that we could make you know say something new about the Penrose inequality. And so we decided we we saw Roger walking into the maths department. And we said, okay, we were we were in the in the offices, and we said, okay, well we should we should just talk to him. We should just you know we should just talk to him and tell him what we're doing and tell him if if he's interested, you know. Uh, and it was a great meeting. It was the first time I really spoke with uh, Roger at length. Um, we spoke for about an hour and a half, and uh, we described to him, uh, you know, what, what had been done in in, in his um, with with regards to his inequality and 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 what was left uh, open and what we were trying to do. 
So that was a, that was a good, uh, that was a great moment for me. This is a picture, I believe it's in the 60s, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, maybe someone can correct me and say, actually, this kind of haircut is more like the 70s. I, I don't know. But um, in any case, um, you, you'll see the language on the board here. We're, we're really in this, been the, um, in, the form, in the formalism pioneered really by um, Roger Penrose. And, and, and here we can see um, a neck, right? That, that, that connects two ends of the Schwarzschild space time. And the little circle here drawn is a, is a minimal surface. And that's gonna be relevant for things to follow, things to come. So just, just for the sake of this picture, I would like uh, everyone just to, just to remind themselves or just to make a mental image of this picture. Uh, we'll come back to it later in the talk and you'll, you'll see why I was so, uh, I put so much emphasis on this, on this picture. So of course my job is difficult, right? I mean, uh, Roger has six volume collected works on Amazon, which you can buy. Um, and there's no chance that I'll be giving anything like uh, a summary of any of this thing. Um, I mean, it's, I'm, I'm just gonna give a little snapshot of some of the things that he's worked on. Some of the things that was so fundamental in his, um, his insights early on in, um, in relativity, at least for the, in the 60s and, and, and early 70s. Um, just a quick history. So he, he was actually a PhD student of uh, algebraic dominators uh, Todd and Hodge, who themselves occupy very, very great places in the um, history of mathematics. So, I mean, Hodge is, 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 of course, a key figure of algebraic geometry. Uh, I should also point out that Sir Michael Atiyah was a slightly older than uh, Roger Penrose, and I hear actually uh, that uh, in a personal, uh, well, in a in a letter written by uh, Roger himself, that he that Atiyah was somehow uh, slightly intimidating as a colleague because, of course, um, of the great things that that he was doing. But um, according to to Roger, I read this in. Um, in, in, um, in an article, I don't remember exactly where, but apparently it was the astronomer Hoyle that had radio shows that got Roger interested in physics. And of course he was lucky enough to attend uh, lectures in quantum mechanics by Dirac and relativity by Bondi. Um, but it was after his uh, PhD in algebraic geometry that he actually ended up doing relativity. And I think Dennis Sharma, who was uh, Hawking's PhD advisor, had something to do with that. Although the details of that story are uh, not something I know. Okay, so now we come to uh, some of his contributions. So, of course, um, today we'll talk about some of his fundamental results in relativity. So that's that's obviously going to be the focus. And even within this class of things that he's worked on, uh, <laughs> there's about ten or eleven, you know, articles or or things that you you could consider as being truly groundbreaking. And I'm only going to talk about one or two of these. So, you know, it, it, it just, you know, gives you a, an idea of the breadth and the depth of, of Roger's work. But I, I also want to mention that um, Roger Penrose has, has, has done marvelous things uh, slightly elsewhere. In particular, he's pioneered various complementary viewpoints on geometry. And by that, I mean a kind of integrating different twistorial, spinorial, projective, and conformal um, approaches to geometry in a way that I think is very... Uh, it, idiosyncratic there's there's I don't think there's anyone who has quite the the viewpoint and the ability to um to put forward these 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 different viewpoints which somehow reveal different aspects of the same thing and of course he's one of the chief uh pioneers of twist theory uh, which is uh you know it, in and of itself a whole a whole subject of course he's worked on other topics um, uh, but I won't have time to cover any of these and I've just written some of these down here. So there's the measurement problem, the cosmological curvature hypothesis, the hour of time, um, and then all kinds of other things that, 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 that he's worked on. Um, but so today we're gonna focus on fundamental results in relativity. Okay, so what are these fundamental results in relativity? This is just, again, a snapshot, but I, I think these 11, well, I consider these 11 to be truly uh, fundamental. So I'm gonna, be very quick here, but but essentially the first thing I, I want to mention is the conformal structure. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. But essentially the point is to abstract away from the details of the field equations, to abstract away from the details of particular solutions like Schwarzschild, like Kerr, etc. Well, obviously Minkowski, and to look at things that are invariant under conformal transformations of the metric. Now you might say, why do such a thing? We'll talk about that. Um, but, but the, you know, this led to, to his notion of diagrams and, of course, the definition of asymptotic flatness, which is key for, 
describing in general relativity the notion that a system be gravitationally isolated. So, you know, even if Roger hadn't done any of the of this work, if it was just number one, that would still be a, a huge, a huge impact, right? I mean, we still look at diagrams that that he drew, uh, you know, 60 years ago. So then, of course, he pioneered a lot of the causal theory that, that was used later on. So that's what I mean by Lorentzian geometry. So that's just basically understanding um, Lorentzian manifolds more generally than simply um, particular solutions and just looking at them from the point of view of geometry. So looking, um, trying to prove theorems, trying to, trying to define interesting objects like trap surfaces and so on and so on. Singularity theorems, of course, this is what he was uh, this is what the Nobel citation referred to. And of course, there's the 1965 um, trap surface theorem and then the 1970 theorem with Hawking, which refines, um, which refines these arguments and, and creates a singularity theorem that's much more uh, well encompassing. Uh, of course, th this has a particular place in the talk today because um, as Simon said, this was some work I did in my PhD. Uh, so I'll, I'll give a little description about the story of what happened there and, and, and and why I'll, um, I, I worked on this. Then there's, of course, twister theory, but I won't talk any, at all about that. Then there's weak cosmic censorship, which of course is gonna be something I have to talk about because that's also something that indirectly I've tried to work on. I say try because it's, it's a very difficult thing and, and it's not like we made um, much progress, but um, at least we're trying. Um, then the extraction of rotational energy from uh, rotating the black hole, that's also known as the Penrose process. Um, then there's a the discovery of the Han Penrose impulsive waves, which have been very much uh, in fashion recently in mathematical general relativity in the hyperbolic community. Uh, with Kronheimer and Garrosh, they put forward the notion of a causal boundary. So this is kind of um, a way to mathematically represent the endpoints of future and extendable time-like curves uh, in the space-time and to understand just where those curves end up as a... Um, with respect to the space-time. Then there's the Penrose inequality. So this is obviously close to my heart because I've worked on this in various ways, both from the Riemannian and both, I mean, the elliptic and the hyperbolic approaches. So I'll talk about this. Uh, so the three red lines here you see are the things I'll talk about, uh, but I won't talk about strong cosmic censorship or Rice and Dorstrom blue shift instabilities, but these are things that he's very much pioneered and he brought to the fore in a wonderful article called Time Asymmetry. And, singularities, which I recommend to everyone. It's in the um, Hawking and Israel volumes for the centennial anniversary of Einstein's birth. And it's truly a marvelous article. It's very easy to read. And you can just see the, the master at work. So what, uh, of course, what is uh, one of uh, Roger's great insights? Uh, there are many, of course, but these field equations look very uh, neat when I write them like this. Uh, and of course, we know that there are exact solutions such as the Schwarzschild metric expressed here in a particular choice of coordinates. But um, what, what Roger did so well and what was so kind of groundbreaking was that he decided to kind of abstract away from these uh, solutions and from these equations and just to look at the kind of more fundamental causal and conformal structures associated with Lorentzian manifolds. So, this, this really, I mean, set the tone for what happened after, and we still speak in, in, in his language. And, and of course, um, I'll describe a little bit more about what I mean by abstract away from the details of the field equations and emphasize on the conformal structures. So I'm now gonna take a little break. This talk is gonna be peppered with uh, breaks here and there. Um, one of the great things about um, having Roger Penrose as a hero is that you read his books uh, and his books contain pictures, and his pictures are very good. Uh, and this is a, the famous triangle. So if you, if you stare at this triangle for long enough, you'll realize there's no such triangle that can exist, uh, right? The shading is um, the wrong way around, so to speak. So you might say, okay, what's the, what's the point of this? I think this is actually a, a, a great um, illustration of the playfulness and of the, of the geometric kind of mastery that, that, that Roger Penrose demonstrates in, in all kinds of ways. So you might, you might think, okay, well, this is just a picture, but actually things like twister theory or, or, or some of the, the insights that Roger Penrose has put forward sometimes just can be resumed by a diagram. 
uh, and that's something that that is definitely true in general relativity in some in some sense, right? With some of the singularity theorems, um, with the notion of a trap surface and and so on. Another little playful thing. Um, so this is a, of course, not a real machine, but the water flows in this direction, right? And then it falls down the waterfall, uh, and it turns a wheel down here, which is a pe perpetual motion machine. So we know these things don't exist, but by very clever drawing, one can give the impression that the water is flowing upwards and then downwards again. Um, I say this because I know that Roger had, um, well, that the Escher and the, and the drawings of Escher were very much in the mind of Roger Penrose for, for some time. Um, there's a whole story behind that, but I, I'm not gonna go into because we're gonna have to do some mathematics at some point. But, um, but anyway, let's, let's move on to the singularity theorems now. So um, upon crossing the street in London in the mid 60s, so this is an initial data set. Think of it as a perturbation of Euclidean space with the, the usual Euclidean metric. I've written infinity here because of course uh, my, my initial data set is gonna go up to infinity. And, and so it's not just a piece of paper, it's not just a rectangle, it truly is uh, an infinite space. Now, I'd like to draw in four dimensions, but of course I, uh, I'm no Roger. So I'll have to draw a circle to give you um, the idea of a sphere. So this circle is a sphere now. Uh, and the outwards uh, arrow and the inwards arrow are just the uh, null normals associated with uh, my circle, which is actually a sphere in a four dimensional space time, if you like. So these uh, arrows are directions in which I'm shooting null geodesics one in an outwardly direction, and the other in an inwardly direction. Now, what Roger realized was that in the Schwarzschild solution, which I've drawn here in its maximal analytic extension, uh, the black hole interior lies in this region um, here. And this region is full of trapped surfaces. Now, trapped surfaces are defined as follows. One can take the area swept by this inwards and this outwards null geodesic as I shoot the geodesics. One can consider how the area of this sphere is changing in this direction. And if it's decreasing in both the inwards and outwards direction, then I call that surface a trapped surface. And the, the idea is that even though I'm shooting my geodesics outwards, right? If, we're, if I'm shooting a beam of light or if I'm turning on a, um, a light bulb in a, in a room, I, I see how the, the null geodesics flow outwards from this um, light bulb and they trace uh, an area increasing, they sweep an area increasing surface. Now the point is that when gravity is so strong, um, even though one is shooting our null geodesics in an outwards direction, the space time is so warped that in fact the area swept uh, is decreasing. And, and so these spheres get smaller and smaller as I go up the null geodesics. And that's what a trap surface is, and that's what it means. The ones I've defined a trap surface just with this inequality, right? Because now this is just an inequality. This is just saying that the area swept by these guys is decreasing. Then I can forget about spherical symmetry. I can forget about axial symmetry. I can forget about all the things that, that are relevant for the exact solutions that we know and love, right? The Kerr and the Schwarzschild families. And then he was able to do something remarkable. He was able to abstract away from this, um, the details of the, of the specific uh, solutions and just consider what would happen in the space time if there were to be a trap surface in there and that some geometric condition, null convergence condition uh, would to be satisfied. So let me quickly go back to the field equations. If I contract, this equation with a pair of null vectors, the metric here is gonna kill that term. So this term is gonna disappear. And then Ricci contracted with a pair of null vectors is just the stress energy tensor contracted with a pair of null vectors. And so this condition right here is simply that the null contractions of my stress energy tensor is non-negative. And that's gonna be, that's gonna be true for a, a whole uh, list of math models.
So this is a rather general assumption on the type of matter which may be present in the space-time. It's obviously true if the space-time is vacuum. And a trapped surface is what I spent the last slide explaining. And now a non-compact Cauchy surface is probably the most difficult thing to, to understand in this theorem. Um, but essentially what this means is that the, uh, I'll take the Schwarzschild example. So in the Schwarzschild space-time, I can draw a space-like initial data set that goes from one end to the other, right? And this is a Cauchy surface in the sense that every, every point in the space-time has the property that any past inextendable time-like curve has to register on this surface. Uh, this is also true in the future direction. Now, why is that interesting? Well, for such so-called globally hyperbolic space-times, the full space-time is nothing other than the Cauchy development of this initial data set. And so what that means is that the space-time has the property that it arises as the Cauchy development of a single space-like hypersurface. And this is not true, of course, of many space-times, but the ones that in, in which this property holds are called globally hyperbolic. And when they're globally hyperbolic, there exists such a surface, it's called a Cauchy surface. And in this case, we assume that surface to be non-compact, just as it is in the um, Schwarzschild space time or the curve. And then the theorem tells you that there is an incomplete null geodesic in the future of this, uh, of this surface. Now an incomplete null geodesic is a null path uh, that is defined and is as long as it can be with respect to the space time, but which is only defined for finite affine parameter, which means that in other words, there's a trajectory here in the, in the Schwarzschild, it's easy to see what happens. It just hits the, hits the singularities up here where the tidal forces are infinite. But a null incomplete geodesic more generally is simply an inextendable curve that's null everywhere and that's a geodesic everywhere, uh, but which has the property that it only defined for finite affine parameter within the space. So this was, this was huge because of course, at this time, the singularities known of in Schwarzschild or Kerr, it wasn't clear whether or not these were artifacts of symmetry or whether or not this was to be a, a, a more robust um, feature. And of course this theorem, there's no spherical symmetry anywhere in this theorem, right? But it tells you that you do get these incomplete geodesics. And so this was, this was a three page paper, which was in the Nobel uh, citation. I don't know if there's been many Nobel Prizes in physics for uh, papers of three pages in length. Um, the follow-up by Hawking and Penrose in 1970 was, was critical because this theorem really only applies to the collapse, uh, right? Because of this existence of a trapped surface, this is more about gravitational collapse. But Hawking and Penrose teamed up after Hawking's own 66 singularity theorem, and they were able to prove a much more general theorem uh, which applies to cosmology and which applies to black holes, et cetera. Now, of course, I got interested in this um, during my PhD and I realized that um, there was something that, that could be done because uh, you see the theorems of Penrose and of Hawking Penrose, uh, they apply to space times which do not have these things here, closed time-like curves. Now, closed time-like curves are trajectories that are closed, but that are everywhere time-like. And so uh, in principle, um, one could follow this trajectory and go back in time. Now in the Kerr solution, which is what I've drawn in this diagram in its maximal analytic uh, form, uh, the, the portion of Schwarzschild that represents an exterior is, would be a little like this um, diamond here. Uh, now the Cauchy surface for the development of the Cauchy surface extends up to the Cauchy horizon, right? And the Cauchy horizon is, is exactly when the, well, delineates the portion of the, the boundary of the, of the portion of the space-time that is determined by the Cauchy surface down here. Now in the Kerr solution, it's, it's really quite a marvelous discovery and it's a marvelous solution because it turns out that beyond the Cauchy horizon, there are both singularities. So there are both, null incomplete geodesics that hit a singularity. But there are also closed time-like curves. Now, the theorem of Roger Penrose tells you that the 
there will be incomplete null geodesics so long as the space time is, non, is globally hyperbolic. But in this case, those incomplete geodesics from Roger Penrose's theorem are ones that simply leave the globally hyperbolic region. But there's nothing particular that happens in this neighborhood here. Everything is smooth, everything is nice, the tidal forces are all finite. In Hawking Penrose's theorem, it's, it's somewhat better, but it still relies on the absence of closed time-like curves. And so when there are closed time-like curves and singularities, we have no theorem that tells us that indeed singularities do happen. And this is what I worked on in my PhD. I tried to kind of prove a theorem uh, that tells you that even if there are closed time-like curves, if the trapping is sufficiently strong, if it's sufficiently profuse, uh, then you will indeed find uh, incomplete null geodesics. So this is the theorem. It's obviously a lot less elegant than Roger's theorem because of course I have to assume a lot more things because it's a lot harder to prove. But um, the, the point is that if you start with a space time, so this, this whole, the assumptions once to four are assumptions which start to bring about the structure of an event horizon in the space time. And then assumptions A to B are, um, well, they're mixed. One is telling you that uh, there's lots of trapped surface in the interior. So all future inextendable null geodesics meet a future trapped surface in O. O is the interior of the, of the black hole in this setup. And then another assumption regarding what type of chronology violation am I permitted? So if there's gonna be chronology violation in how big is it and how much of the space time is violating chronology? And under assumptions, which apply to the, to the Kerr interior, one can actually prove indeed that there are uh, future null incomplete geodesics in O. So in other words, this gives you the first theorem that actually applies to the Kerr solution. This is a picture of the, of the theorem. So I have something like a space like hypersurface down here. I have something like an event horizon here. And then the interior of S, the future chronological future of, of, of S is the interior O. Uh, and then if there are lots of trapped surfaces, even if there are closed time like curves, I will still get an incomplete null geodesic. And so the idea was to find out exactly what trapping you need and what kind of closed time like curves are sufficiently tame that you can still prove that indeed you will get incomplete null geodesic. Okay, so that finishes part one of the talk. Uh, and we're now gonna move on to um, something slightly different. So we've just seen that trap surfaces lead to incomplete null geodesics. But one may ask the question, well, okay, how do we actually form trap surfaces in the first place? How do they come about? And what do they look like? Well, this was resolved, well, this was resolved. This was first looked at in, in great detail and generality in the theorem of Shen Yao, and then later refined in Yao 2001. And now we're dealing with initial data sets. So these are Riemannian manifolds that occur as Cauchy surfaces for space time. We're not looking at a space time anymore. Now, what the theorem tells you is that if the energy density is sufficiently large, mu and j here, I'm not gonna bore you with the details, but they arise from the particular time-like contractions of the stress energy tensor when we look at the three plus one decomposition of the field equation. Now, when there's a particular lower bound on, on this, uh, on the on this term, mu minus j, j is the local angular momentum, if you like, and mu is the local energy density, then provided that some geometric quantity defined as radius, I'm not gonna define radius to you, but there's a whole definition for it. It's quite a subtle one. Then provided the radius is sufficiently large with respect to uh, lambda, which is this uh, lower bound appearing in the stress energy density, then in fact, there are trapped surfaces in F. So a picture for the theorem, if I can zoom in, is that as I increase my mass concentration, right? Or if I increase my radius, right? If I increase the radius for the same lower bound here, then eventually I'll get to a stage where the radius is so big and the density is, is, is so high within that region that in fact a trap surface exists somewhere in the domain. So this is a picture of the theorem. And of course, for those who, uh, have read Kip Thorne's book, uh, this will remind you of the uh, hoop conjecture. And so here we are. The hoop conjecture is the statement that, so 
the hoop conjecture has a fun history in itself. And in fact, um, I know that Roger Penrose was interested in it for, for, for a while. The hoop conjecture is essentially the following thing. Suppose you have an initial data set, right? And suppose you want to say something like the following. If the mass of that region is sufficiently large with respect to some boundary geometry quantity associated with the boundary of that region, then there should be trap surfaces within. In other words, if matter gets concentrated in a sufficiently small region, then in fact, uh, there are trap surfaces. So this is now uh, another picture of the theorem. You're agnostic about what happens inside. You don't know what happens inside. It's just a Riemannian manifold with a particular boundary. And the idea is that you, you define some quantity M, which is some quasi-local mass quantity. So that's a boundary geometry object, in particular integrals over particular types of quantities over two spheres, in particular here, the boundaries of course, two sphere. Um, then if this is sufficiently large with respect to L, now L here is the, is the diameter of the, of the boundary. So that's the soup of the distance between any two points on the boundary. Um, then if, if the mass here exceeds uh, L, which is a measure of essentially how, how large the diameter is of the, of the boundary, uh, then you have trapped surfaces with it. So this was, this was a, a conjecture put forward by Kip Thorne in the early 70s. But of course, in his day, there was neither a definition of quasi-local mass nor much of an understanding of what, what quantities really would work in such a theorem. So the hoop conjecture is still very much a theme in research and not really a conjecture as a, like a number theoretic type of conjecture, because of course, the notion of quasi-local mass and general relativity is kind of open. There's no right definition. There's many different definitions. They all have their, their perks and their disadvantages. But what we did with uh, Agil and with Yao, and this was my, this was the first thing I worked on when I, when I moved to Harvard's Black Hole Initiative was the, uh, was the following theorem. So uh, suppose the initial data set, right, again, Riemannian manifolds that embed as, uh, as a slice in a, well, as a domain in a, in a Lorentzian, Manifold. So for an admissible initial data, uh, there is a quasi-local type quantity, m omega, such that if m omega is larger than a quarter L, the boundary of omega, then in fact, there are trapped surfaces in, in omega. So this is the first the hoop conjecture that uh, people have shown in the Lorentzian, um, well, in a, in, a, in a way that only relies on the dominant energy condition, which is... Um, so there was a previous theorem of this nature, but in the purely Riemannian setting uh, by Shi Tam in 2007, but this one is the, is the first one that kind of gives a hoop conjecture type stuff. Okay, so let's move on to something else now. Let's move on to weak cosmic censorship. So this is scry, right? So the endpoint of uh, null geodesics, outwards, outwards null geodesics in the space time, if you like. Uh, this is scry minus, so the endpoints of the past directed null geodesics. This is an event horizon for a black hole that's forming. Uh, this is an initial data set. This is another initial data set, but this time this one contains a trapped surface. Uh, and then this is, a, this is a further initial data set in the future of that, where you see the, the trapped surface is causing the surface to, um, to converge on itself. So weak cosmic censorship was put forward in 1969 by uh, Roger Penrose. And the basic idea was kind of in the spirit of the singularity theorem in the sense that the singularity theorem tells you that you can get away from spherical symmetry and still have singularities or still have incomplete null geodesics. But what about the formation of event horizons? What about the, the, the claim that when some initial data set evolves, it actually produces something which asymptotically looks like Schwarzschild or Kerr and therefore enables us to define an event horizon. In other words, are event horizons generic? Do they actually occur? Or are they just remnants of these solutions, the symmetry of these solutions? So it's in the spirit of the singularity theorem, but it's much, much harder because of course, now we're dealing with a problem in terms of initial data. So we have simply an initial data drawn like, like so. And then the question is, suppose this evolves so now it moves to the future. As it evolves, I have to solve the entire space-time, solve for the so solve the whole Einstein system of very difficult PDEs, and produce a space-time whose future 
can be associated with um, a conformal infinity in the form of scry plus, et cetera, just like uh, the solutions that we know and love of stationary black holes like Schwarzschild or Kerr. And so um, the conjecture, one form of the conjecture, because there are different forms, but one form of the conjecture is, is, is as follows. When trap surfaces form dynamically, generically, they lead to space times which are qualitatively like Kerr at infinity. So this is not, strictly speaking, a, a, a precisely stated conjecture, merely a, kind of a theme to, to try and describe what's going on here. But the idea is that you want to show that, suppose I have an initial data set like this, then as it evolves, if it leads to the formation of trap surfaces, these trap surfaces always lie behind an event horizon. And in particular, they produce a future complete scry, um, which I can associate to the space time by virtue of a conformal embedding. So when, it, when we come back to the picture I showed you at the beginning with Nikos and I, we, we saw Roger Penrose and we walked up to him and we were very um, you know, starstruck, of course, he's our, he's our hero. Um, well, we, we talked to him, we said, okay, so we're doing something dynamical. So we're, you know, we're solving for the, for the actual uh, space time, right? The actual evolution of initial data. And uh, it turns out that in the process of doing so, we can actually test the inequality. We can test the Penrose inequality. Now, we asked him, where does the Penrose inequality come from? What, why did you come up with it? Why did you propose it as a conjecture? Why, you know, where did it come from? And he, he told us he was playing devil's advocate, right? Because the idea was that, suppose we cosmic censorship is true, then what that would tell us is something like, well, what that would suggest is something called the final state conjecture. Now the final state conjecture is the claim that not only do they behave qualitatively like current infinity, but they behave quantitatively like current infinity. So in particular, the, the ADM mass, the area of the event horizon, all these things behave just um, a, approximately like they, they, they behave in the curve, in the curve space. Time. And if you carry that argument through, uh, then what, what you end up with is the Penrose inequality, or as I call it, the litmus test for weak cosmic censorship. And by that, I mean that if this is false, Right, if we're putting a red line through this thing, then that puts weak cosmic censorship in grave doubt. And I think that's really symbolic of Penrose's genius. He knew that weak cosmic censorship was far too hard to solve in the, in the methods of his time. It's still far too hard today. However, he realized that by taking weak cosmic censorship seriously and by extracting from weak cosmic censorship the following inequality, then he could have a much easier conjecture to uh, which, which if false would spell grave troubles for weak cosmic censorship. So I said much easier. In fact, the Penrose inequality is still open <laughs> for generality. So it's not all that easy, but it's still much easier than, than weak cosmic censorship in a certain sense, because it's a purely elliptic problem, a purely geometric one. So what does it say? It says that suppose you have an initial data uh, and the boundary is an, is an outer minimizing marginally outer trap surface. Now, marginally outer trap surface is nothing too, um, too, too different from a trap surface. It's simply asking that the expansion uh, right, of the outwards direction is vanishing as opposed to strictly negative, right? The null expansion, the um, area swept by the null geodesics, it's just uh, vanishing. The, the change in that area is just vanishing as opposed to decreasing. These surfaces occur as boundaries to uh, initial data sets that intersect event horizons in the typical Schwarzschild or Kerr space time. So, you, you know, these are, these are kind of representatives of the event horizon at the level of initial data. And the claim is then, well, the ADM mass of such a slice should be bounded below by the area of these marginally out of trap surfaces over 16 pi to the square root. And in particular, there should be some rigidity statement so that if equality holds, uh, if these two things are equal, then this initial data has to arise as something from the Schwarzschild space time. So we come back to this picture that I told you to, to focus on at the beginning of my talk. This is what you would see if you went through the Schwarzschild space time in, in this direction. So let's come back to this slide, right? So 
if if I traveled from space like infinity through this point and back to and back to infinity, then in fact what I'd see is this. And in my drawings, this. So this is as these spheres get bigger, right? You go out to infinity in this direction. And as these spheres get bigger, you go out to infinity in this direction. And where they meet is this little circle, which is of course a two sphere, and that's called a minimal surface. Minimal surface is a, a surface having the property that when you vary the surface normal to the surface, its area is, is unchanging. So I can cut away everything that's below here. I can cut away everything that's below this surface. And then I end up with an initial data set with a boundary, which is a minimal surface. And then the conjecture says, well, the ADM mass of this initial data, which of course is going to be the limit of a certain quantity that I take over two spheres. And then I take these two spheres that become increasingly large. Uh, well, that should be bounded below by the area of this surface here. And the, this, so this is the conjecture that you come to uh, that, that Roger Penner has put forward uh, by taking uh, weak cosmic censorship seriously and the final state conjecture seriously. But it's a heuristic argument that he proposes, but it turns out that this is the conjecture you get. Now, this conjecture is still open. And so I also wanted to mention some of the work we did with Aguil and Yao is that we actually proved the first uh, Penrose inequality for a space-time initial data that doesn't have any additional unwanted constants on the right-hand side. So what we proved is in fact a stronger version of this, of the Penrose inequality because we proved it for the Liu Yao or the Wang Yao quasi-local mass. However, it's, it's, it doesn't resolve the full conjecture because of course we have to assume that the initial data is admissible. And that is a very long and technical condition expressed in terms of various types of functional inequalities you know, that arise in the proof, et cetera. So this is a very ugly and, and technical condition. Um, but, but granted, if, if, if this technical condition is in fact true, if this initial data satisfies this uh, admissibility condition, then in fact, the Penrose inequality, and in fact, a stronger version of it, because one that doesn't assume um, that doesn't use the ADM mass, but rather some quasi-local mass quantity, which um, I should have uh, reminded you of what that is. So quasi-local mass is a, a quantity that's defined over a surface, a closed surface. And it's usually a two sphere. It's always a two sphere, basically. Um, now the Liu Yao or the Wang Yao are two types of quasi-local masses that people have put forward. Um, and they have all kinds of wonderful properties, such as, um, you know, for instance, they converge to the ADM mass as you take the spheres to infinity. Um, they're non-negative if the energy density of the spacetime is non-negative. They're zero if and only if the spacetime is Minkowski. Uh, you know, that they've got all these kinds of wonderful properties from the geometric point of view. Um, and and so yeah, so we proved that in fact, if you have initial data set like this, uh, and you have a MOTS down here. Uh, then if you take the quasi-local mass, uh, say on this surface, uh, which is of course two sphere, uh, then it's going to satisfy this inequality so long as the um, initial data is admissible. As I said, this doesn't prove the full conjecture because we have these technical assumptions. Okay, so let's move on to the, to the final part of, of, of the things that I've worked on that are uh, related to Roger Penrose or that are, that are very much in the spirit and motivated by the work of Roger Penrose. So this is um, formation of black holes and, uh, and formation of, of uh, trapped surfaces. So in 2008, Chris Tadulu dynamically formed trapped surfaces. So what that means is that Roger Penrose's 65 theorem tells you if you have a trapped surface and you're globally hyperbolic, then you have a null and complete geodesic. Shane Yao's 83 theorem or the Yao 2001 refinement or the theorem by Agil and myself and Yao in 2019 tells you if the quasi-local mass or the energy density is sufficiently concentrated, then you'll have a trapped surface. But no one actually was able to have a theorem of the following form. If I start with initial data without any trapped surfaces, but I put initial conditions suitably well, suitably cleverly, then I can show that in the evolution of this data, a trapped surface will form. Now, this was a groundbreaking work of Christodoulou, something like 600 pages of hardcore hyperbolic PDE, where he was able to show precisely that. 
precisely he was able to show that that if the initial data was was designed sufficiently well uh, then in fact the future evolution of this initial data would lead to a trap surface even though there were no trap surfaces to begin with of course from the point of view of astrophysics this is interesting because you know we think of black holes as things that actually come into being we don't think of them as as things that are there for all time we think of them as things that come into being and so we have to mathematically we have to play you know we have to make sure that we can give a good story for this we have to we have to tell you know how do these black holes actually form well one way of of trying to answer that question is well how do trap surfaces in the first place how do they form uh, and of course this was the first time that anybody really um got to grips with that question so in 2012 Li Yu uh found a way of constructing conditional examples of weak cosmic censorship or of um the final state conjecture if you will so final state is just a as I said before when gravitational collapse occurs at least in the vacuum asymptotically flat setting uh, then the end state of this is something like the Kerr solution right so the Kerr is an, is, a, is an attractor solution for gravitational collapse that's the final state conjecture and of course you might have gleaned that from the words final state right um so they they found a way of uh of combining Christodoulou's local result because it is kind of a, a semi-global or local result with some some clever elliptic gluing techniques um, that were developed in kind of in the last 15 20 years uh, to kind of construct conditional examples so what they do is they they combine this dynamical viewpoint of Christodoulou with some elliptic work and they're able to 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 produce an initial data set that doesn't have trap surfaces on it it's a complete space-like initial data set that doesn't have trap surfaces anywhere in it but the future of this the future development of this initial data set does have trap surfaces and in particular, they produce the initial data set so that the outside of a compact set, the initial data set is actually isometric to a space-like hypersurface that embeds in the Kerr space-time. And so by combining a form of Kerr stability yet to be proven, of course, but by combining a statement of Kerr stability with uh, their initial data set, one could produce a picture which has an initial data set with no trap surfaces, and a full evolution of that initial data set with a complete future scry, satisfying thus weak cosmic censorship, and which is qualitatively and quantitatively like Kerr, thus being an example of the final state conjecture, which is still, of course, open. So what we did with, uh, with Nikos, and this is the picture that, that I showed you at the beginning, uh, so this is what we were working on when we when we saw Roger and we and we and we and we talked to him and we said, well, look at this. This is this is this is what we're doing. Is it interesting to you? What, what do what do you think about it, etc.? Um, is that we kind of combined this and this and some work of Anne Luke and some work of Anne, which kind of does a a, a, a slightly different versions of these of these theorems. So in in Anne Luke, they have kind of milder data. So the data from the analytic perspective is smaller in, in certain types of um, norms, natural norms associated to this kind of um, problem in hyperbolic PDE. And then Anne does a kind of, well, he's able to form marginally out of trap surfaces rather than trap surfaces. But in fact, and, and this might sound as, as if it's almost the same, but it's actually quite a bit harder because when you form a trap surface, it's an open condition, right? You, 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 you want to form a surface that has something associated to it, which is negative. But of course, a marginally out of trap surface is something which is equal to zero so from the from the point of view of pde you have to solve an equation as opposed to solve an inequality and solving equations are harder than inequality so of course um this takes quite a bit more work and in fact the way that's done is by using the extra control of the milder data uh, of the of the and luke setup but anyway nikos kind of used these these works and combined them and essentially showed that um well, it, sh it showed the following things. So it said there exists a non-trivial uh, vacuum class of examples of weak cosmic censorship if Kerr stability holds. Moreover, these examples satisfy the Penrose inequality dynamically with precise estimates for the relevant geometric quantities. So, so remember, the Penrose inequality was Penrose's way of saying, well, we can't solve weak cosmic censorship. But if weak cosmic censorship is true, then this inequality should also be true. Now, this inequality in and of itself is open. But the inequality can be tested and can be, can, one can ask the question, is this inequality true for space times undergoing gravitational collapse? And of course, we don't have many of these, but we have some examples and one can construct, right, classes of such examples by combining all these, all these kinds of works and by 
tuning the initial data, solving for the Einstein vacuum equations, you know, doing all the, all the work. Uh, and then it turns out that the, the extra control given by this kind of like finely tuned data enables you to prove geometric estimates that are good enough to actually prove for the first time the Penrose inequality in a dynamically evolving scenario. So the picture is this. Uh, one has sp space-like infinity over here, a portion of scry plus over here, a portion of scry minus over here, an initial data set, which is isometric to uh, a space-like hypersurface that embeds in the curved space time, at least outside a compact set. And then through this null hypersurface, one shoots a pulse of radiation, right? This is what my red line is uh, supposed to be. That's a pulse of gravitational wave. And this forms a trapped surface over here. Remember, every point in this diagram is a two-sphere. Then this is the boundary of the dark region the dark region is full of trap surfaces and the boundary of this region is foliated by marginally out of trap surfaces. And then one can solve for an extra slab of particular size that's limited, right? Because the data is large and so it's hard to control. Um, but given the solution of, of this slab in this portion, then one can use corvino shane elliptic gluing techniques across this annulus, right? If every point here is a two-sphere, then a line is, of course, an interval cross S2. And so this is an annulus. And so solving the gluing problem across the annulus, as corvino shane does, one can interpolate between Christodoulou's dynamical slabs and a very precise asymptotic model solution in the, in the form of the Kerr geometry. And then you'll say, okay, well, where is the Penrose inequality in all of this? Well, because the gluing produces something which has a particular control on the ADM mass out here, remember the ADM mass is evaluated on spheres that go out to infinity, so it's all the way over here. And because one has precise geometric estimates for the area of the marginally out of trap surfaces that occur uh, when you send in these pulses of gravitation, gravitational waves, then one can ask, is the inequality that compares the ADM mass out here and the area of the marginally out of trap surfaces out here, is that inequality satisfied? In other words, is this inequality true, right? This was the ADM, this was the Penrose inequality. So ADM mass and area of marginally out of trap surfaces. And in, in fact, it turns out that indeed we can prove this, that indeed uh, the, the mass dominates the area uh, of these marginally out of trap surfaces, at least for some portion uh, of the um, of the of the diagram, and then when we get to the outer edge here, um, the estimates are no longer refined enough to to make sure the inequality is true strictly. Um, but in any case, this falls short of anything like final state or weak cosmic censorship, because we don't have an event horizon in this picture. The space time hasn't been solved for, uh, and this is where one would like to use the fact that this is a Kerr initial data, because remember this this whole guy here is Kerr. Uh, and we have some, some analytic control on the geometric quantities out here that we can actually solve. Uh, so we can't, but, but one day perhaps, uh, you know, might, that might be possible to solve for the rest of the space time and to produce a complete future scry. If that can be done, uh, then, then one will have uh, the first non-trivial examples of the final state conjecture and weak cosmic censorship in this, um, for, for, for the formation, uh, with respect to the formation of trap surfaces. So this was, this was the final uh, chapter, I guess, in, the, in, the, in my talk or, or things that I've worked on that are directly inspired by, by Roger Penrose's work. So we, we, we had the singularity theorems, we had the Penrose inequality, the hoop conjecture, and then the dynamical formation of black holes and the weak cosmic censorship and so on. Um, but of course, Penrose's conjectures, you know, in full generality is still open. So in particular, um, the Penrose inequality is open, it was solved in the special Riemannian case by Husky Nilman and Bray with incredibly beautiful geometric techniques and Riemannian geometry and their PDEs. Generalizations to negative lambda and to uh, dimensions between three and eight were done uh, in the last uh, 15 years, 20 years. Then the inequality with a worst constant on the right hand side was proven by uh, Ali Curie in 2019. Then it was proven under specific admissibility conditions, but without the worst constant by uh, Aguil Yan and myself. Uh, and then dynamical Christodoulou type examples uh, were put forward by uh, Nikos and myself uh, in 2020. 
Weak cosmic censorship is true for the spherically symmetric scalar field by Chris Dudu's groundbreaking work in the 90s. It spans over five or six very difficult deep papers, maybe less than that, actually, maybe three or four. But, but these, I mean, these papers are still being read today and still being um, understood. Non-symmetric conditional examples were put forward by Li Yu. Uh, so 2012 was the archive, 2015 was the, the actual publication date. And of course, we uh, refined these somewhat, or at least we did this for the, for the milder initial data, which, you know, under which we can get more control. Now, strong cosmic censorship, I haven't talked about at all. And maybe this is something we can talk about in the discussion, or maybe this is you know, something for, for another time. Um, but this is more about whether or not global habitability is expected generically in the course of evolution. Uh, that is to say, when I let an initial data evolve, uh, does it produce uh, something that's inextendable beyond its uh, Cauchy development? And if, if the answer is no, then determinism is, is put at risk for general relativity. Uh, if the answer is yes, then determinism is uh, saved, so to speak. Um, now, uh, this was sh the, a very strong version of this conjecture was shown to be false if cursedability holds. Cursedability is, of course, people very much believe in this. This was done by the Fermat League in 2017. And then uh, it, it's been shown true for certain spherically symmetric models. Uh, and that's a lot of authors from 2005 to today. And there's a lot more to say about strong cosmic censorship in the positive lambda or the negative lambda uh, scenarios, but that's far, far beyond what, um, what we wanted to do today. And that's the last picture. Uh, thank you for listening. Um, thank you, Martin. Thank you. Some applause, I think. Well done. That's a beautiful talk. Um, <clears throat> um, okay, so... Um, so we will um, take a break now for a few minutes and resume for Q&A. Thank you, Martin.